all, it's a pleasure to be here amongst uh, a bunch of heathens. Um, I agree. First of all, it's a little disturbing that they can fit all of the heathens from the greater Phoenix into one room, but we won't be too surprised. Some of the heathens like to sleep in on Sunday. I know you guys. Okay, this is a Sunday morning, which meant that you guys were brought up to, to, to kind of feel guilty if you didn't get up Sunday morning and go to church. So instead of getting up Sunday morning and go to church, why do you kind of get up on Sunday morning and be heathens? But that's good. Yeah, it's ironic. Um, mentioned that, that maybe in the, in the, uh, the popular press, what I'm best known for is the image of the Eagle Nebula which are the three columns of, I suspect a lot of you have seen it, like one of them wound up on a postage stamp with along with a couple of bucks will buy you a cup of coffee, but it's still kind of fun. The irony, of course, is that those are most commonly referred to in the popular press as the pillars of creation. And uh, anyway, I have to say, too, that the issue, um, you know, I wasn't going to speak to this directly, but the issue that was brought up of, of raising children outside of the church is a very interesting issue. We have three daughters, um, our youngest daughter, our oldest daughter is actually a first year graduate student in physics doing cosmology at Princeton this year, so I'm proud of her. Uh, our youngest daughter is a, is a junior in high school. And it's been really very interesting for them growing up. We've had this conversation a lot of times that they know what it means to be a religious minority and having to grow up in a world where, you know, you can you can be a gay Nazi for Jesus and everybody's happy, all right. But if you say I don't believe in God, that's the one thing that's just not allowed. And um, anyway, what I'm going to talk about today, testing the God hypothesis, what it means to know. Mostly, what I'm going to talk about is this last part, what it means to know. But I figured for this group that if I started it off with something like testing. God hypothesis. That would be sure to bring in lots of people. So, you know, you get a, get a good topic. Um, I'm going to start off kind of on my home turf. And that is, I'm an astronomer. That's what I do. And so, if you look at what astronomy is these days, this is an extraordinary time to be doing astronomy. We live at the first moment in history when we can claim to know the answer. So what has to be considered the central question of science. You start out with the Big Bang. Happened 13.7 years ago. You can actually see the Big Bang. One of the remarkable things about astronomy is that we can actually see the universe evolve. Because as you look at things farther and farther away, you're seeing things that are farther and farther in the past. And so when people say, gee, we weren't there and we didn't see it in astronomy, we can say, the heck we weren't. You, know, you just go out and you take the pictures and there it is. When you look at the sky, in fact, at microwave wavelengths, what you in fact see is that the sky is a glow. And it is a glow from the radiation that was left behind from the Big Bang itself. So if you look at a picture like that, which is actually a picture that was produced by a thing called the COBE satellite, the Cosmic Background Explorer satellite, you are actually looking at a baby picture of the universe. Okay? And that universe looks very different from today. Turns out that that universe that you see when you look back 13.7 billion years in time is smooth beyond smooth. It is, it, is, it is smoother than the blue of the bluest sky. And yet, when you look at the universe today, you find a very different place. A universe of stars and galaxies and planets and gorgeous Arizona sunsets and people. In other words, when you look at the universe today, you look at a universe filled with structure. The central question of modern science is the question of how you get from here to here, the origin of structure. And in fact, um, at some point, if you decide to have me back, I'd be happy to come and talk about that story per se, because it's a fascinating story. I want to touch on the high points, though, just to give you a sense of where we're at with this. This is now another picture of the universe 13.7 billion years ago. But this is now after you remove the smooth part. And you find out when you do that that there are a few bumps left over. Those bumps, courtesy of a thing called gravity, tend to collapse. And when they collapse, they form galaxies. Gravity causes those galaxies to fall toward each other. 
giving rise to something that's referred to as large-scale structure, the distribution of galaxies in the universe. Within those galaxies, clouds of gas and dust, like this one, this actually is the Eagle Nebula. This is a ground-based image of the Eagle. These dense interstellar clouds of gas and dust. Here's the Hubble Space Telescope picture. If you look at this picture in infrared light, you see interesting things. You see that buried down inside of those are places where clumps of material are collapsing and forming new stars. Turns out when those new stars form, for reasons that have to do with why you can make a pizza dough by spinning it and throwing the dough in here, when those stars form, they're surrounded by disks of gas and dust. From those disks of gas and dust, planetary systems form. Add to that the inexorable algorithm of evolution, because that's what it is, and give it a few billion years, and here we sit. A very brief, this is how we got here. The question is, you look at the story I was just telling, starting with the Big Bang and ending 13.7 billion years later. There we are with Rodin's thinker sitting there pondering all of this stuff. The question is, how in the world can I, as a scientist, have the unmitigated chutzpah to stand up here and claim to know not only what the universe was like 13.7 billion years ago, but how it is we got from here to there? Because at least in broad outline, I do claim to know the answer to that question. To get to the answer to this question, how can science claim to know the answers to such remarkable questions as these? What we have to do is ask another question. What do I mean when I say I know? What is the nature of knowledge in the first place? And I'm going to suggest that, in fact, an awful lot of what this organization is about fundamentally comes down to how you answer that question and whether you, in fact, have a considered answer to that question. So what does it mean to say I know? What I'd like you to do, I had intended originally to pass out sheets of paper and have people actually do this. I, we didn't do that, so instead I'll just ask you to, to uh, in your mind, take a couple of seconds and think of five things that you know about the world. Let me quiet for just a second. Let you think of it. Five things that you know about the world. Evolution. Now, not call them out. I want them, I want these just in your brain. I just want you to think about it. This is the thing. I actually do this activity with my introductory classes uh, to try to get them to think about these kinds of issues without actually pushing them over the edge. So what I'm about to do with you is an activity that I do with my, my introductory classes. Um, when people ask me what I do, I will occasionally say my job is, is corrupting the moral generate generation. They think I'm joking. Um, five things that you know about the world. OK, you've got a list in mind. Now what I'd like you to do is to think about those things and on a scale of 1 to 10, Imagine how certain you are of that knowledge. Okay? And what I want you to do, in fact, is I want you to think of those things that you thought that you, that you say you know about the world. Which are the two that are the things that you are most certain of? Okay? Yeah. Is that better? Oh, yeah. All right, better. Hey, I can even, I don't even have to swallow this one to have it pick me up. This is a good thing. All right. Everybody had in my mind two things is really what I'm looking for. Two things that are tens for you. Things that you know about the world. Next question is a little bit harder. For the top two items on your list, think about how you know that each of those items is true. Top two things that you know about the world. All right. How do you know? Did you think about that for a second? According to Richard Paul, who is the director of a thing called the Critical Thinking Institute, who's done a study of such things, 
The three most common reasons that people believe something is true are the following. They believe it's true because it's true because I believe it's true. You know, that's it. Complete tautology. The second reason is it's true because we believe it's true. A little bit different statement there. That's a statement that says I'm part of this group, and part of being a part of this group means that I believe the following thing. So by virtue of the fact that I'm a member of this group, we believe this to be the case. Third reason is wishful thinking. It's true because I want it to be true. Okay. I would really like to believe that there's this kind of long-haired man with a big gray beard who sits up there and makes sure that the world works to my benefit. That would be a nice thing to believe. I believe it's true because I want it to be true. An honest question for you. When you realize that picking up and reading something in a book or being told that something is true by somebody you might trust or, you know, any number of things like that fall into the category of it's true because we believe it's true or it's true because I believe it's true. How many of the people, the top item on your list, it's true because we believe it's true, or pardon me, the top item on your list, you know because of some reason like that. I'm not going to really ask for a show of hands because in this particular setting it's, oh no, I can't actually admit it, but... I'm one of those people who sometimes believes things just because I believe them. But in fact, we all are. The problem, of course, is that none of these things have anything to do with what really is true. Nothing whatsoever. And so if I'm going to stand up here as a scientist, and I'm going to have the gall to suggest that I can tell the story of the universe, then I had better have some standard for what I mean by I know that goes beyond it's true because I believe it's true or it's true because I choose to believe it. Science has its own standard for knowledge. If you're going to do science, you have to know what it means to know. And it turns out that standard for knowledge is associated with the thing called the scientific method hypothesis, prediction, and test. Without talking to your neighbors, think for a second how you would complete the following phrase. The scientific method is the way scientists blank. Why don't you think about that for a second? And I'm just going to call on people at random. Young lady right here, the scientific method is the way that scientists blank. What? Well, test their hypothesis, okay. Looking, let me get another answer. Gentleman right here. Think and work. Think and work. You guys are the wrong audience for this. You thought about it too much. Yeah. Acquire knowledge. Acquire knowledge. See, when you do this with freshmen, everybody has the same answer. Yeah. Validate their theories. Validate their theories. Actually, a lot of these are a little bit, you guys are clever enough that you're giving me answers that are actually a little bit tautological. Okay. The scientific method involves hypothesis, prediction, and test, so it must have something to do with the way that you use prediction, test the predictions of your hypothesis or something. I'm looking for a little bit more basic answer. The scientific method is? To find out the truth. The scientific method is the way that scientists prove things are true. And if you ask a room full of freshman students at ASU what the scientific method is, that's what all of them will tell you. Well, not quite all of them, because if they've taken the first semester of my class, they know it's the wrong answer. <laughs> the scientific method is actually not the way that scientists prove things to be true at all. In point of fact, the scientific method is a way that scientists try to show that an idea is wrong. And it's a little bit strange to think that that is in fact the basis of what it means to know if you use the term as a scientist. Scientific method is not the way that scientists prove that things are true. Scientific method is a way of trying to show that an idea is false. Which leads to a very interesting definition of what it means to know. If I say that I know something, it does not mean that I have 
proven it to be true. Instead, when I say that I know something, what it means is that I have tried very, very hard to show that it's false and have so far failed. And that is, in fact, the basis of knowledge. It might be different from the way that you might have defined knowledge or the definition you might find in a dictionary, but in point of fact, it's not so different from your everyday practical meaning of the term knowledge. For example, if I say the following, I know that the sun is going to come up tomorrow. All right. Is there anybody who would take great umbrage that I had abused the use of the term to know in the statement, I know that the sun is going to come up tomorrow? You would take umbrage at that. Why? You know that uh, in 10 billion years, the sun is going to explode. So at some point, it's not going to come up. Oh, but I mean tomorrow. I mean, literally tomorrow. I know that the sun is going to come up tomorrow. The question is, no, I, it's not just believe. I'm going to say, I know that the sun is going to come up tomorrow. And that I'm going to suggest that is that usage of the term to know is completely consistent with your everyday sense of what knowledge is. The question is the following. How do I know that the sun is going to come up tomorrow? Well, because I can't prove that it's not. Think of it this way. I've been around for years, and um, so far, every morning, I've gotten up and said, okay, today is my day that I'm going to prove that the sun doesn't come up every day. All right? And so I get up, and I look over there in the east, and here comes the sun. And I say, shucks. Um, and then the next day, I say, okay, today is the day that I'm going to prove that the sun doesn't come up. Sun comes up, shocks. All right. After enough years, you say, okay, I have predicted day after day after day that the sun is going to come up, and so far, I've been right. Okay. So eventually, you get to the point that you just say, I know that the sun is going to come up. Because I have tried, and I have tried, and I have tried, and I have tried to show that the sun doesn't come up, and yet it does. I have tried to show that that idea is wrong, and so far I have failed. And eventually you just get to the point that you say, I know that the sun is going to come up. This leads to a very interesting statement. All knowledge is provisional. You never know anything in science for sure. If you, all you can do is try to show that something is wrong and consistently fail, it's, there's always going to be the possibility out there that maybe the next thing that I do to try to show that my idea is incorrect is in fact going to succeed. Yeah? The statement all knowledge is provisional. Is that known to be always true or is that true? <laughs> Actually, it turns out in fact that the statement all knowledge is provisional is a false statement. Um, one plus one equals two, for example, is not provisional knowledge. If you know what one means, and you know what plus means, and you know what two means, then the statement one plus one equals two is just a statement of logic. It's, it's a necessary statement. So really what I should say here, if I were being a proper philosopher, I would say that all contingent knowledge is provisional. All knowledge about the world that goes beyond just simple logic. There's no certainty in science. The irony of that, I know there are a few people in here saying, but wait a minute, that's not really what it means to know. But in fact, it is what it means to know. Because it's the best that we as human beings can do. You know, I, that, that's given that we don't have divine inspiration, the best that we can do is to take our ideas and try to show that they're wrong, test them, challenge them, compare them with fact, and eventually, if you consistently fail to find their flaws, you start to say, I know that's the case. The irony of that is that that is the strength of this sort of knowledge rather than the weakness. You know, a lot of students say, well, gee, if that's what knowledge is, you scientists don't know very much. The heck of it is is that once you have declared something to be truth, capital T, you know, for the, um, what is it? is it? Is it BC that the guy is always getting up there and standing on top of the, the pillar that has truth written in it and they say things and then the lightning bolt comes and zaps them? 
DC is a comic that really annoys sometimes. Anyway. <laughs> Point is, is that once you have declared something to be truth, that is, once you have said that there is nothing that could ever make me change my mind, that I'm so certain of it, that even in principle there is nothing that could ever make me change my mind, you have just separated yourself from reality. You've just said that the picture you carry around in your brain about the way the world is takes precedence over the way the world really is. Okay? The cornerstone of science. In science, the truth of a statement is determined by the predictions that the statement makes about the world. Predictions that can be tested by anyone, regardless of who they are, and regardless of whether they want to believe the statement or not. Okay. The cornerstone of science, then, you say, what is science? If you had to sum up the cornerstone of what it means to know, that's the word that you would use. Falsifiability. For a statement to be useful, what that means is that the statement has to make predictions about the world that if they turned out a certain way, would force you to depart with your belief in that statement. Let's do my earlier example. I know that the sun is going to come up tomorrow, or that the sun comes up every day. Suppose that I went out tomorrow, and I watched for the sun to come up, and the sun didn't come up. Okay? What would that force me to do? Get a nice warm home. What would that force me to do, as far as my knowledge that the sun comes up every day? It would force me to say that piece of knowledge was incorrect. The theory that the sun will come up every day is in fact falsifiable. It's not false, but it's falsifiable. There is some experiment or some observation that I might make about nature that if it came out a certain way, it would force me to leave that theory behind. Okay. To be useful, to be a statement about the world that has some content, that statement has to be falsifiable. It has to make predictions that if they turned out a certain way, it would force you to depart, to leave that idea behind. Now, it's clear that it's important to realize that falsifiable does not mean false. Another statement. I know that the earth revolves around the sun. That's a falsifiable statement. That is, there's a whole set of observations that I might make that if they came out a certain way would force me to depart from that belief. And yet that's not a statement that's false. The, um, yeah, it was very apt, the, the opening <coughs> talking about Galileo and his belief in the sun-centered sun -centered solar system. Um, this is an idea, in fact, that plays a large role in the history of science. Another thing that you've heard is, after all, it's only a theory. How many people have heard that? For example, talking about evolution. Now, after all, evolution is only a theory. Okay. The heck of it is, is that it's also only a theory that the, the Newton's laws work. It is only a theory that force equals mass times acceleration. It is only a theory that the Earth revolves around the sun. Gravity. Gravity is only a theory. The point is, is that all of those theories make many predictions about the way the world should be, and people have tried and tried and tried and tried and tried to disprove those theories, but have so far failed. Now, in everyday parlance, when people talk about a theory, the problem is that they don't mean a theory at all. They mean a wag. And since I don't see many kids in the audience, I'll say, yeah, anybody know what a wag is? Wild-ass Yeah, a wag is a wild-ass guess. You know, when people talk about a theory, usually what they're talking about is they're talking about a wild-ass guess. You know, I have a theory that if only Bob Brimley would have done this, then instead of being nine and a half games back, the Diamondbacks would be at the top of the, okay. That's not a theory, that's a wag, yeah. No, we usually call it a swag. A swag? A scientific wild-ass guess. No, okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Thing is, is in science, a theory is something that's very different. 
In science, a theory is a well-developed idea or group of ideas that's consistent with known physical laws and that makes testable predictions about the world. A very well-tested theory may be called a physical law or it may simply be called a fact. Again, in everyday conversation, if I say it is a fact that the Earth rotates on its axis, is anybody going to take me to task for that? If I say it's a fact that the Earth revolves around the Sun, is anybody going to take me to task for that? No. Those are so well, not anymore. Yeah, at one point, you know, Galileo just wound up under house arrest. Poor Giordano Bruno wound up burned at the stake for such beliefs. And yet today, those are theories that are so well tested that even among fundamentalist Christians, you could probably get away with saying it's a fact that the earth revolves around the sun, and they wouldn't take you to task for that. It's not a fact. You don't know it for certain. It's just a theory that is very, very, very well tested. A well tested scientific theory is the pinnacle of human knowledge. An ironic thing. You start out saying that I'm never going to claim to be certain, that instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to constantly be about the business of testing hypotheses, trying to find their flaws, always allowing for the possibility there might be a problem somewhere. And in the process, what you arrive at is the closest thing to certainty that humans are capable of. Now, yeah, am I certain of that? That's we could get. If you really want an answer to that question, then you know we should plan to get together every hour for the next, you know, three days a week for the next semester, and we can explore that question. Let me give you a quick acronym, just because it's a fun thing. Uh, this was a thing come up with by James Lett. You can find this on the. Uh, if you go to the, to the Skeptical Society's webpage, you can find this there. What science demands of any claim to knowledge is the following. First and foremost, acronymous filters. First and foremost, an idea must be falsifiable. That is, it must be possible to conceive of evidence that would prove a meaningful claim to be false. Doesn't mean that it is false. It means that you have to be able to conceive of some observation or some experiment that if it turned out a certain way would force you to conclude that your statement is false. Arguments must be logically sound. All of the evidence must be considered. Your argument must be comprehensive. You have to be honest about it. You don't start out deceiving yourself, starting out by saying, I know what the answer is. So I'm going to accept any piece of evidence that, that I like, and then I'm going to find a reason to ignore any piece of evidence that I don't like. That's not honest. Things have to be replicable. Turns out that way once, ought to turn out that way again, turn out that way again. And evidence has to be sufficient. The evidence has to be adequate to support the claim. So when you're going through life trying to think about, okay, how do I, how do I know these things? There's an acronym to keep in mind. Filters. If you can remember that falsifiability, a statement has to be falsifiable, it has to be logical, you have to look at the evidence comprehensively and honestly. Evidence must be replicable and it must be sufficient. And if you will carry that out into your lives and put it to work, you will find that you don't buy much snake oil. You know, um, anyway. So here's the sense of the idea in a nutshell. I'm going to just boil it down to its essence. Suppose you're going out to buy a used car. How do you buy a used car? Do you go and look at the used car and say, gee, the alignment looks kind of awful to me, but oh, I'm sure it's OK. That's just because it's sitting funny. And you know, gee, why is it that there's black smoke pouring out of the back end? Oh, I'm sure that if I just let it warm up, that will go away. And um, no, that's not the way you buy a used car. If you buy a used car, what you do is you kick the tires. And you bounce on the bumper and you see if you can make the suspension do something bad. And you look on the ground underneath and you look for signs of oil leaks. You check under the hood. You take it out on the highway and drive it under fairly severe conditions. Why? Because what you are trying to do is you're trying to force the car to fail. 
Because the way you find out whether this is a car that you actually want to buy and drive home is you push on it. And if you push on it hard enough and it fails, you say, I don't want that. But if you push on it pretty hard and it still seems okay, then you say, all right, maybe this is a car I'll drive around in for a little bit. What science does is essentially apply precisely that same standard to what it means to know things about the world. An idea that survives even after you have tried very, very hard to find its flaws. An idea that still hangs around even though you and other people have tried and tried and tried to show that it's wrong. That's an idea you can hang your hat on. That's an idea that's worth driving home. And that's the nature of knowledge in science. Any questions about that before we go on to the next bit of this? Because it's essential. That, you know, what I'm really trying to do here is not just give you a little bit of entertainment this morning. What I'm really trying to do is, to, is to, to tickle your brains enough to get you to walk out here and go, you know, to leave here this morning and kind of go, huh, gee, um, I never thought about it that way. And put this to practical use. Okay. So questions, comments, yeah. I hope you're going to knock down the prevailing idea that there's a God. Well, <laughs> that idea's been around for some We're time. headed in that direction. <laughs> I want to start with just, you know, what I'm trying to do here is try not to be a preacher. I'm trying not to just get up here and say, we all know that there is no God, and so let's get together and let's talk about there is no What I'm trying to do is to develop an idea of what it means to have knowledge about things. So let's talk about that in itself first, then we'll move on. Yeah, there's a hand back there. I, I would be more inclined to say that I predict the sun is going to come up tomorrow rather than saying I know that the sun is going to come up. Okay, but the point, I understand your point. That is, if you're going to say, if you're going to be very, very formal about it, you're going to say, I have a theory that the sun is going to come up tomorrow. And you're going to say, I have a theory that force equals mass times acceleration. And I have a theory that Earth revolves around the sun. And I have a theory that humans evolved from, from other forms. And you know, if you're going to be formal about it, that's what you say. But the point is, is that if you're formal in that way, then you never get to say, I know about anything other than one plus one equals two. I don't see it so much as a formality because we as a species have a tendency to be real sloppy when it comes to the use of language. <laughs> no, I agree, but the point that I'm making is the following. We use the verb to know. We say, I know this, I know that. The point is, is that you have to think about what that verb means. And people carry around a sense that when you say, I know something, that what you mean is that you're certain about it. What you mean is that this is absolute truth, carved in stone, there it is, knowledge. And what I'm trying to point out to you is that that's a simplistic notion of what the word knowledge means. Which is why I don't use it for try okay. to That's okay. Which is in fact fine. I mean, I, when I'm teaching, class. I, on the other hand, lots of people claim to know all the things all the time. You know. They know that Jesus... Uh, so let's take the next step. Anybody ever heard somebody make the claim that, well, okay, science is science, and religion is religion, and the two can just coexist in peace, because these are different spheres of knowledge. And one doesn't apply to the other. So, you know, if you want to know about scientific questions, you should go talk to a scientist. If you want to know about spiritual questions, you should go read the Bible. And the two are separate. Okay. Yeah. Well, that was uh, the Harvard evolutionary biologist that just passed away. The two domains. Stephen Jay Rule, yeah. He was a proponent of that. Huh? He was a proponent of that possible, at least at the end of his life. No, he wasn't. Oh, well, he, he, said that two, he did talk about two domains. Oh, he did talk about two domains. You hear lots of people do that. You will even, under the right circumstance, hear me do that. Okay? 
For the following, and you say shit, and I know, I apologize. <laughs> Problem is, is that at some point, too much truth, if you're trying to change the way that people think about things, you kind of have to ease them through it. You know, you can't just walk in and say, I expect you to, on my word, simply disavow all of the nothing. It doesn't work that way. This statement that the two are separate is one of two things. One thing it is, quite often, is a statement of double think. I actually know some scientists who do cosmology, who claim to be born-again Christians. And I scratch my head and say, how in the world? The reason is, is that they have figured out a way inside of their brains to hold two completely contradictory viewpoints. That turns out to be something that we need to, that evolutionary biology has prepared us to do. Uh, let me, with, in conversation before the meal, um, or before the talk, we were talking about this question. Turns out that evolution has taught us how to hold contradictory viewpoints. Imagine that you live, you are a member of a large society that holds some outlandish view, okay? And you say, that view is outlandish. I'm not going to profess that. That's craziness. What have you just done? Well, you've just cut yourself off from the group that you need to be a part of if you're going to pass on your genetic information to the next generation, is what you've just done. There's a strong evolutionary pressure for us to accept the belief structure, the norms of the group of which we're a part, regardless of whether they make any sense. The other thing that that statement quite often is, as it is in the case of Stephen Jay Gould, for example, is it's a statement of politics. That is, if by insisting that believing in evolution means that you give up your belief in God, okay, then guess what? In a political sphere, you just lost the battle. And so the way the game is played is to try to say, okay, understand these things. Separate them from your discussion of God, but understand these things. That's a political thing. It's not a statement of what it really means to know or whether the two are, in fact, contradictory. Questions about that? Yeah? Uh, sometimes I read critics of science use the word scientism, which kind of, you're familiar with that? I'm familiar with that. The notion that, well, science is just another form of religion. The difference is the following. The standard for knowledge that I just provided to you is something. I say that I know the Earth revolves around the sun. Okay. Regardless of whether you are Caucasian, black, American Indian, Hispanic, Asian, regardless of whether you live here in Asia, in South America, regardless of whether you were raised Christian or Jew or Hindu or Muslim, you can go and test the predictions of that hypothesis. And you can they either turn out or they don't. And the answer that you get doesn't have anything to do with what you want to believe is true. That's the difference. Science is not a religion. Science is a very formal statement of this is how you go about testing your ideas about the world in a way that doesn't depend at all on what you want to be true. Here's something that I know, okay? Here's a 10 on my personal scale. I know, stomp my foot, that the universe was created three seconds ago by a great deceiver intent on fooling us into believing that the universe is really billions of years old. I know that. Okay? I'm absolutely certain of it. Just ask me. You know, we've even got this whole group that gets together every Sunday out in East Mesa and we talk about how we know about... Well, actually we don't. Because you see, the universe is really only three seconds old. And so the way that I know this is because I was created three seconds ago, complete with memories of these meetings where the revealed wisdom of the fact that the great deceiver made the universe three seconds ago was implanted in my brain. Question. I just told you that knowledge depends on falsifiable predictions. What falsifiable predictions does this statement make? None. 
You know, when I do this with a bunch of students, you know, they'll say things like, yeah, but wait a minute, I remember more than three seconds ago. I'll say, no, you don't. You know, you were created three seconds ago, complete with a whole set of memories of things that happened before that. And in fact, the first of this sentence never took place. Okay? They'll say, but what about that light that we see from distant stars? No, 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 the universe was created three seconds ago with all of that light en route so that we'd see it. What about the radioactive ages of the... No, 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 all that stuff was created three seconds ago with the isotopic balances such that it makes it look like they're thousands or millions or billions of years old. Okay? This statement about the great deceiver makes no falsifiable predictions, which means that it's impossible to show that it's false. It can never be disproven. Okay? So it's possible to make statements like this that have truth value. I mean, there either is a great deceiver or there's not a great deceiver. It's just that it's not something that you can know. You can never disprove that. The point is the following, though. By virtue of the fact that the statement about the great deceiver makes no testable predictions, I contend that that means it's logically impossible for belief in the great deceiver to offer any meaningful insights into the world. In other words, either the statement about the great deceiver is testable, either it gives you information about the way the world is that you wouldn't have otherwise, or it's useless. Okay? Logically useless. You can either test a statement like that, or it's meaningless. The problem is, is that belief in the great deceiver is not harmless. If I truly believe in the great deceiver, that might lead me to imagine that, in fact, that as one of the true believers in the great deceiver, if I then decide that the great deceiver told me that all of you, bunch of heat, boy, the universe would be better off if you weren't around. So the great deceiver tells me, you know, that might lead to lead me to take some drastic act. You know, belief in the great deceiver is not harmless. It could lead me to act in a wide variety of irresponsible ways. And that lands us with this question of whether you can apply this standard to religion or not. Can you get away with saying, my religious faith is just something that I believe? So here's a dialogue. Skeptic, your religious faith makes no sense. It's a system of beliefs that dates from a time when men believed that Earth was flat, was located at the center of the universe, a time when men believed that angels carried the stars and planets through the sky. It makes no sense in light of what we now know about the universe. So says the skeptic. The believer comes back and says, but this doesn't have anything to do with my religious faith. After all, the very nature of faith means that I take things on faith. I believe things that cannot be tested. Religious faith doesn't have to make sense. Okay? You've all heard that argument made. To which the skeptic responds, then God is a ham sandwich. <laughs> And then the very puzzled and outraged believer realizes that he's not being taken seriously <laughs> and says, that's ridiculous. God's a ham sandwich. That's nonsense. That's nuts. To which the skeptic responds, but you said that religious faith doesn't have to make sense. You can't have it both ways. This is an argument, by the way, that was made. If anybody, had, anybody in here read the book Darwin's Dangerous Idea by Daniel Dennett, it's a very, very good book. I strongly, strongly recommend it. This is the thing that he talked about there. The point is, when you talk about something like religion, or an idea like the great deceiver, it has to make sense. You can't escape it. You can't say that, well, I'm going to hold, I'm, I'm going to hold some aspects of my knowledge about the world to the standard that they have to make sense, but then I'm going to have this other thing over here that I don't apply that standard to. You can't use that out, even though they do. Which brings us to 
what I promised in my talk title, The God Hypothesis. The God Hypothesis, I'll state as follows, the God Hypothesis says that the universe, specifically human beings, were created and given purpose by a benevolent God who remains active in history. The God Hypothesis. <coughs> my statement is that the God Hypothesis is subject to precisely the same standards that any other hypothesis can be subject to. That is, that the way that you find out whether the God hypothesis is true is not by reading the Bible, not by reading the Quran, not by going out and asking people who believe this. The way you find out whether the God hypothesis is a statement that's a statement that you can hang your hat on is you challenge it. You attack it. You take its predictions and you test them against what's actually found in the world. People talk about testing, you know, the, 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 the evolution versus creationism thing. Gee, we want creationism in the schools. There's a huge part of me that says that, yeah, I think that is a great idea. I think we should teach both evolution and creationism in schools. That is, what we should do is we should take evolution and we should take creationism and we should treat them to precisely the same treatment. That is, we should take each, and we should use it to make predictions about the world, and then we should go and test whether those predictions are true based upon evidence that's accessible to anyone whether they want it to be true or not. And if that's what you meant by teaching creation as a science, then I'd be entirely in favor of it. Because it is impossible to find a, well, in my experience, it's impossible to find a better example of how to see the difference between science and anti-science than by applying the standards of knowledge of science equally to both the theory of evolution and to the theory of creationism, the God hypothesis. So there's the God hypothesis. Testing the God hypothesis. If this is true, then one would expect what? Lots of things. If this is true, for example, one would expect that scripture would provide insight into the universe that went beyond the technology of the times. Okay. For example, if the God hypothesis was true, and specifically if the Bible were divinely inspired, then you would imagine that the Bible would tell you things about the way the universe is, you know, the sun and the stars and the planets, that turned out to be correct when we actually had answers to those questions. Did it? No. You would expect if the God hypothesis is correct, that it would tell you about things about the origin of humanity that couldn't have been known by the people around at that time. Did it? No. In other words, if the God hypothesis were correct, there really was this revealed wisdom, then you would imagine that as we learn more and more about the universe, that that knowledge would be converging on what the God hypothesis told us ahead of time, based on this notion of revealed wisdom. It doesn't. That's a testable prediction of the God hypothesis. It turns out not to be true. Another testable prediction of the God hypothesis, or at least the Christian version of the God hypothesis, would be that, gee, if God really wants us to be all Christians, then over time, you should see people moving in that direction. In fact, in a statistical sense, you're not. Okay? I mean, there are lots and lots of tests you can make. And I'm not going to go down the list, because really what I want to do is I want to leave this as an exercise for the student. Okay? Testing the God hypothesis, it's not my business to do that for you. It's my business to make you think a little bit about what it means to know, about what knowledge is, about how you arrive at knowledge, and about whether that standard applies to questions like this, and then to send you out into the world to do the testing yourself. Let me tell two stories. The first story, is the story of how I wound up as a heathen. I was maybe 14 years old, something like that. My father was an evangelical Christian. 
when I was 14 years old, I wanted nothing more than to feel the touch of God. I wanted to know what it was to speak in tongues. That's where I was coming from. And a bunch of friends, ironically, you're talking about um, uh, scouting. Ironically, the, the friend who made the comment I'm about to relate was, in fact, an Eagle Scout. So <laughs> We were sitting around on a camp out one night, and we were talking about all these questions, like the question of good and evil, you know, the question of why God allows bad things to happen, all of these kinds of questions, and we were struggling with this. And this friend of mine made the following comment. He said, you know what? All of these questions just make a lot more sense if you stop trying to impose the idea of God. What if there is no God? And at the time, I was appalled. I, just, I remember, I was just vehemently, I, that's outlandish. How could you say such a thing? How could you even dream such a thing? But the seed was planted. And what I found over the next year or so is I just couldn't help myself. I started looking at situations and asking myself, does this situation make more sense if there is a God? Or does this situation make more sense if there's not a God? In other words, what I fell into was my own version of testing the God hypothesis. I have two competing hypotheses, God, no God. And over a couple of years of doing that, I came to realize that if you actually paid attention to the world, that the God hypothesis was simply untenable. It simply didn't make sense. That the only way you could believe that was literally to believe in the great deceiver. Literally believe that there exists a God who is actively trying to fool you into believing he doesn't exist. <laughs> Another story that I'll close with. <coughs> My oldest daughter, as I pointed out, is now a first-year graduate student doing cosmology at Princeton. You know, we're, the, there are lots of funny stories having to do with that, one of which is that when she started off to, as an undergraduate, uh, she said, gee, I've lived with an academic for all of my life, and I know two things. I know that I want a life, okay? <laughs> She'd seen me sit up at the late o'clock in the morning working too many times. And, and she said, I'd also like to make some money. You know, she knew better than to think that you actually put the money in the bank as an academic. And so she announced that she was going to go off to college and become a, an engineer. And that's what she was going to do. About halfway through her second semester, though, she called her one day and she said, Dad, um, you know, I never really quite understood that being an engineer meant that you had to hang out with engineers. <laughs> Apologies to the engineers in the audience. Uh, yes. Can I just say this as a humanist? Um, I accept that you're a chooser. Your daughter chooses not to live with engineers. I chose to live with one. <laughs> I accept that um, scientists have a very cool way of thinking about knowledge, and they and they um, they're, they they don't really choose story over testing. But in fact, I do both. I test some things in my life and I choose some things. I choose to live in Arizona. I choose to um, let me, get let my me, house red. But my let, me, let me return is, to that. Let me, my point okay. is that I can enjoy people who choose to believe in God. I can enjoy people who like the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe. And Hitchhiker's I, Guide to the Galaxy. Yeah, so we're, excuse me. I can also choose to be inaccurate and close to the facts and not actually on the facts. Okay. So the point that I'm trying to make is that that's a human condition. And belief in God, I can test that tomorrow there'll be somebody who believes in God. The problem is, is that they need to allow me to choose to not believe in God. Okay, Look, there are a variety of things. Let me finish my story and let me come back to that because that's a good kickoff to discussion. To finish the story, my, uh, my, my oldest daughter, who said, gee, Dad, would you be terribly upset if I changed majors to physics? And I said, of course I wouldn't be upset if you changed majors to physics. Um, when she was five years old, having been raised in a household where we didn't push 
And we didn't go to church, clearly, but we also didn't push disbelief on the kids. It was just really something that, that you know, it didn't seem appropriate to shove things either direction because that's not something the kids think about. Um, she was about five years old, and a friend of hers were out in the backyard. It was about this time of year, and they got to talking about the meaning of Easter. And Jana said, I think, you know, Easter has something to do with when Jesus died. And this little friend said, oh, no, no, Jesus didn't die. Jesus is still alive. He came back to life after he died. And my five-year-old daughter thought about it for a second, and she says, but that's magic. And really, there's no such thing as magic. And if God's just about a bunch of magic, then there must not be any such thing as God. And I was astounded. Because here, a five-year-old child, simply by virtue of not having been indoctrinated into the belief in God since she was big enough to think, at the ripe old age of five was a more accomplished theologian than the vast majority of adults. She saw right through to the heart of it that if the God hypothesis says that we live in a world full of magic, and if that doesn't conform with the way the world is, and that's just not a hypothesis upon which I'm going to hang my hat. Thank you. I, I'd actually like to start, if I could, I would like to start with your comment as the first question. The comment that you raised is that there is that there are things that you choose, there are things that you know. I accept that. I, too, can enjoy people who believe in God. I mean, I'm a, I'm, I am a person who enjoys life. I don't know the happy human assemble, but it sounds like one I need to get acquainted with. Um, you know, I, I'm from a family. That there, there is no joy in my life greater than, than taking my family back and being with my more extended family, and we have great fun, and I love them all dearly. And... There are some things we just don't talk about, and this is one of them. Okay. I understand. I'm not going to say, I'm not going to, you know, you know, take exception with that. Tolerance. If I live in a world where I expect to be tolerated for the fact that I reject this notion that most people believe, that means that I have to act in a way that is tolerant of them as well. Okay. Tolerance goes both directions. It's fun. On the other hand, is it really okay to say, I choose to believe something, I choose to base my life on some notion that is not in fact correct? And despite all of that tolerant stuff, in the end, I'm going to say that that's really problematic. Because when you believe things like that, it leads you to do things like build armies and send them go marching off to kill the heathens. And that doesn't mean you might be a Muslim who decides you're going to go kill the heathens by slamming a plane into the side of the World Trade Center. Or you might be a Christian who decides that you're going to kill the heathens by sending armies off into the Holy Land in a crusade, whether you do that in the 13th century or the 21st. Or you can say, because of my beliefs, that means that I am going to base a system of social justice on the notion that there is the absolute right and wrong and that some things are sinful and that that's what I'm going to base my judgment of people upon rather than upon any kind of real knowledge about what it means to be human or why we act the way that we do. As I said earlier, knowledge in the great deceiver, or belief in the great deceiver can cause you to do lots of irresponsible things. And so as humanists, we're in kind of a funny situation where on the one hand, you want to be tolerant. On the other hand, you recognize that you live in a society where this thing we call religion, this thing we call the belief in God, is in fact a force for, for mighty evils, if you will allow me to use that term. It's a quandary, something that we have to think about the best way to approach. Yeah. Being tolerant of the intolerant people. Like when uh, Salman Rushdie, uh, some Muslims in uh, England wanted to kill him. 
So yeah. people are like, oh, well, we can't interfere with their system. I, no, 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 you're getting it wrong. You, if you do believe in tolerance, you cannot tolerate those who don't tolerate. It's sort of a trick with words. There used to be signs that hate hatred. Either way you go with that, no. you're, you're contradicting. I think it's a trick. No. Uh, we, we had somebody here about uh, euthanasia. You yeah. don't have euthanasia because of religious people. I'm not content with religious people. Because they are not just going to have their ideas and leave me alone. Exactly. We're going to make laws for that. So I, I don't want to be awful about it, but yeah, I like to plant seeds and get people to think. I uh, mentioned planting seeds in the message board, and that got young people real mad. No, 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 you can't plant seeds. That's arrogant. You're thinking your ideas are better. Everybody's ideas are exactly the same, or exactly equal. Well, and these dance, and, well I, don't, I don't buy that. I think that in some things, if my car doesn't start, I'm better off taking it to a mechanic than my neighbor. You know? Yeah, so, yeah. That, exactly. Yeah, I exactly. you'd know more about uh, astronomy than uh, the guy in the bar room next to me. Yeah. The, the phrase that I use when I talk about this is very close to what you were talking about. And that is, my, my catchphrase for these is tolerate all but intolerance. That, that anything that is an imposition of the will of others upon you based upon a belief system that you don't share is intolerant of your rights. And you aren't wrong to stand up and say that out loud. I agree entirely. In referring to the Big Bang Theory, you seem to present it as a fact rather than a theory. Okay. What's a fact? I, ta I gave you a definition for a fact. A, a fact is a theory that people have tried very, 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 very hard to show is incorrect and have so far failed. The Big Bang is a theory. Newton's laws are theories. Gravitation is theories. The motion of Earth around the sun, the evolution of humanity are theories. And yet those are all theories that are so well tested. People have tried so hard to show that they're wrong and have consistently failed that at some point, I just I don't feel the need to consistently, every time I say it, say, okay, this is a theory. Because it's a theory that is a theory that you seem to be able to hang your hat on. Now, if you're going to ask me, are there things, experiments that you could do that would force me to change my belief in that theory, to change my understanding of that theory? Absolutely there are. There were people in the early part of the 20th century who were forced to revise their understanding of Newton's theories of, of motion because of relativity and quantum mechanics. Very recently, we've been forced to revise our understanding of the theory of the Big Bang as a result of the discovery that the, the expansion of the universe has accelerated. So yeah, they're theories, and you keep testing them, and you keep testing them, and you keep testing them. But even so, within the context of this thing that I call knowledge, I say that we know that the universe began 13.7 billion years ago in the Big Bang, and we know an awful lot of what happened since then. And in the everyday use of the word no, I feel completely justified in making that statement. Yeah. How about um, the alternative theory that the universe is eternal, had no beginning, will have no end? It simply changes form within itself. Okay, this is this is actually a discussion that if you, if if I were giving the talk about the the origin of structure and the Big Bang and all that kind of stuff, and I would have spent the last hour, in fact, talking about the evidence that causes you to say that that's not the case. Um, there are huge, huge numbers of observations, predictions that are made by the Big Bang theory that people have gone about testing, and they all turn out to be true. And so you have two choices at this point, really. And that is either you accept that the Big Bang Theory is essentially correct, or you accept that somehow a universe that did not begin in the Big Bang has been structured in such a way to make it look a whole heck of a lot like it did. Okay, And that's kind of the situation we're in when we talk about it. Again, that's what it means to test theories. Eventually, you get to the point that you say, either this is true, 
or the series of happenstance that happened to make it look like that true is just remarkable beyond belief. You know, either, either you believe this is true or you imagine there's a great deceiver trying to trick you. And that's kind of where you stand with respect to things like the Big Bang or with respect to the theory of evolution. Um, this is such a fun discussion. I think one of the reasons we come together is because we get to have these fun discussions. But it just occurred to me that this week we're celebrating Watson and Crick and the DNA. Mm -hmm. And finding out that the uh, story that we're aligning that test to is the story of Adam and Eve. So in fact, we're calling it, you know, the whatever, African Adam or whatever. Again, I'm inaccurate. But the interesting thing to me is that you have this story, this human story, as time goes on, and you have this testable hypothesis. And when you go back to the thing about what is it that's theory and what is it that's fact and what's testable and what isn't, is that there's this whole part of us that's not testable. And, um, and we, um, we align the two in very strange ways some of which are intolerant. And so I guess just that, isn't it funny that at the time that we're disproving the story of evolution through this theory, we're also proving this story of Adam and Eve. Don't you think that's amazing? Well, actually, that, the, your, let's start with the science. The science that you're relating is backwards. Um, the notion of mitochondrial Eve is a, is a very interesting it turns out that mitochondrial DNA, not the DNA in the nucleus of an atom that, that is reproduced sexually, where you mix that from the mother and the father. Mitochondrial DNA is the DNA in, in small little organisms inside of cells that is passed on only from mother to child. So you have the same mitochondrial DNA in your body that your mother did, that your grandmother did, that your great-grandmother did, that your great-great-grandmother did, all along that matrilineal chain. It turns out that because of that, statistically, you can say that you can go back at some point and say that at some point, that in a population, you know, there were lots of people around, but that there was only one individual whose mitochondrial DNA has survived to today. That's a statement of statistics. And when you hear about this thing called mitochondrial Eve, that's what you're talking about. You're not saying that there was a single woman who was the who is the only female ancestor of all people around today. Rather, what you're saying is that that it turns out that going from mother to child, mother to daughter to daughter to daughter to daughter to daughter to daughter to, daughter to us, that you can trace that back to a single individual. Those are different statements. Um, it's thought, in fact, that at the time that mitochondrial Eve lived, that the size of the human population was probably numbered in the, what, Kevin, I want to say maybe tens of thousands or some number? 30,000. Huh? How small am I? Uh, the number I've heard is of, is of order thousands, yeah. Yeah. It was a small group. <coughs> the other part of your comment, and you have, uh, let, let me say another, you have to be careful about that. Because people who are trying desperately to hang on to their fantasies will latch on to something. Somebody invents the term mitochondrial Eve. And without understanding it, they stand up and say, see, here's the thing that disproves evolution. Okay, it's a very poor choice of, of term. The other part of your question. What it means to be human. Stories. All of that. Nothing that I have said takes away in the tiniest bit from what it means to be human or to feel what humans mean or, or to, to feel what it means to be human. Let me give you another example. Um, I know a lot about physics, okay? We could go out and we could look at a sunset and I could tell you about the sunset is red because as, as white light from the sun passes through the atmosphere courtesy of Rayleigh scattering, which is a lambda to the minus four effect, that the blue light is scattered away, the red light preferentially makes it through. And so when you look at the sky, it looks blue because that's the blue light being scattered out toward you. When you look at the sunset, it looks red because the red light manages to make it all the way through that atmosphere. And when you look at the clouds that are painted all different colors, you can understand all of that because some pathways, the red light can make it preferentially and the blue light can make it preferentially to other pathways. I can talk about all of that. 
Does that make the sunset any less beautiful? I argue no, it doesn't. And in fact, I'm going to argue that in a certain sense, it makes the sunset more beautiful. Let me give you another example. Beethoven. Anybody in here not know who Beethoven is? Anybody in here aware that Beethoven was deaf as a stone when he wrote his Ninth Symphony? Okay. How is it that Beethoven, when he was deaf as a stone, was able to write and appreciate the beauty of a piece of music far better than I ever could, even though I have good hearing? The answer is because he understood it. That he so understood the interplay between, between melody and counter melody, between point and counterpoint, the interplay of chords, the sounds of the instruments, the way that they merged, that in his mind, through that understanding, he was able to create and appreciate something appreciate its beauty more than I ever will. Okay? Understanding, appreciating who we are as the products of evolutionary biology does not take away from, from our, our, I hesitate to use the word, but our specialness. It emphasizes it. Understanding who we are only makes the reality of human experience that much more extraordinary. It makes you appreciate who we are that much more. Understand why we are special that much more. Understand why it's so important that we hold on to this fragile world of which we're a part that much more. I hate to do this, but we're just about out of time. Um, you're going to have to come back. Um, I would love to. Absolutely. Before we go, one, one other thing for you, um, somewhere, here it is, and that is our human society oh. uh, thanking you, and if you come back, you can you build your collection each time you come back. <laughs> Thank you very much. Don't forget, one week. If you appreciate the Humanist Society of Greater Phoenix and would like to see more, then subscribe to our channel and check us out on Patreon. Links are in the description.